talk about some music. Uh, I'll tell you what, somebody kick me off. Somebody get me started. Okay. <laughs> well, man, jumped on in there. I, I, my, my name is Bob Berger from Laguna Hills, and uh, I've been very impressed with uh, your career. And I was wondering, since the development of a musician is so much entwined with personal history, could you tell us your story and how you developed as a musician? I'll tell you my story. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, my father is a jazz musician. Well, well, he is now. When I was a kid, my dad uh, played in a lot of rhythm and blues and soul groups. Uh, he played with a very popular group, some of you may know, called the Delphonics. And uh, then he played with Billy Paul. Then he played with Blue Magic. Then he played with Major Harris. So uh, my childhood was uh, immersed in Philly soul. Um, by the time I got old enough to really appreciate what my dad was doing, by then he had started, he kind of slowly got into the jazz world and started working with Mongo Santa Maria. Uh, so the first time I saw my dad play and actually kind of got it, he was playing with Mongo. Uh, that was in 1978. And uh, my great uncle, who was also a bassist, he's, he's an acoustic bassist, uh, he has always been a jazz musician. Uh, he kind of played more or less on the avant-garde scene. He worked with a lot of cats like Byron Lancaster and Con Jamal, um, Sonny Murray, people like that. Uh, and now he is a member of the Sun Ra the new Sun Ra Orchestra. Uh, I can't remember his band name, because you know all those guys have names. <laughs> uh, but uh, between my dad and my great uncle, it was pretty, I, it was destined that I was going to be a bassist. I saw my dad play and I got so interested in the electric bass, I asked my mother for a bass for Christmas and um, I got my first electric bass when I was eight years old. And um, I started listening to the radio a lot, all of the albums that we had laying around the house. I, I was very lucky that, as you can hear, my family was so immersed in the music business. Uh, my uncle, who passed away now, he used to work for a very popular uh, R&B radio station in Philly. So he, between my dad and my great uncle and my uncle, there was loads of music just surrounding me as a kid, um, mostly soul music, a uh, little bit of jazz, a little bit of classical, a little bit of reggae, um, always some top 40 pop around, but mostly it was soul and rhythm and blues. And uh, I started playing the electric bass, and I really fell in love with it immediately. I feel like I was lucky in that I found my thing uh, early in life. Uh, when I was... After I'd been playing the electric bass for a couple of years, my mother saw that I was um, really getting interested, and she decided, well, we're going to send you to a school that has a really good music program. Uh, what's very sad is I know in 2008 it's much harder to make that decision because there are not many public schools that even have music programs anymore. Um, but at that time in Philadelphia, there were a number of good junior high schools that had a music program, so uh, I went to a place called Pepper Middle School in, in Southwest Philly, and they had a really great orchestra, and that's when I started studying the acoustic bass. I got my first teacher, uh, my first private teacher. I started learning how to read music, all of the, the beginnings of, of you know music theory 101 and training and, and classical study. And that's how I got into the acoustic bass. And I always knew that the acoustic bass was like the the coolest jazz instrument of all time. That instrument, like if someone would have asked me what instrument to you represents jazz, I wouldn't have picked the trumpet, wouldn't have picked the saxophone. I know those are like the two most popular instruments. I would have picked the bass. Because every time I'd ever seen anyone play the acoustic bass, it was like a really cool jazz musician, like, like my great uncle. And my great uncle is like your classic image of a jazz musician. You know, he wears a tam. You know, he had like the horn rim glasses. You know, he had a goatee. He looked like Dizzy a little bit, you know. Uh, smoked Paul Malls. Um, 
always talk street hip when he, you know, everybody was baby or a cat, you know. Uh, so my great uncle is was so, well, he is. He he's so so super hip. Uh, every time he would listen to records, he always kind of had the same pose. He would sit in his chair and just kind of lean straight back and like, Phew. yeah, baby, dig that. <laughs> so. I got a lot from my great uncle just watching him listen to jazz um, because he was always so cool, you know. Um, and when I started taking acoustic bass lessons, uh, classical lessons, of course, uh, my great uncle, he got wind of it that I was now playing the acoustic bass and he got so excited, he says, uh, hey, come by my house tomorrow, I want you to check some stuff out. And I was uh, 11, yeah, I was 11 years old, and so I went over to his house, and uh, he said, now that you're playing the upright, I'm going to school you to all the cats. You hip to Paul Chambers? I was like, no, who's Paul Chambers? He said, right, well, sit down. And um, he played um, Miles Davis live at Carnegie Hall, the 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 one with the Gil Evans band, and uh, my great uncle became so animated watching, you know, listening to Paul Chambers, and so I'm listening to the record, listening to Paul Chambers, and the older I get, the more I love my great uncle because um, he never talked to me in classic jazz veteran terms, you know, he never stuck his finger in my face and says, you know, this is our music and you better learn this and you young boys don't know nothing about this good music, y'all listen to all this, blah, 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 blah. Uh, he always made it fun. Uh, Paul Chambers would play, you know, like four bars before Paul Chambers would play something extra slick. My great uncle would say, all right, now Chris, check this out, check this out, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, here come, here come. All right, dig this. And then he would start playing air bass along with the record and then he'd go, woo, you dig that? Ain't that bad? I was like, well, I don't really know what I just heard, but <laughs> because it moves you so much, it must be bad. <laughs> so uh, I started, um, my, my great uncle gave me a bunch of records. Um, everybody, Paul Chambers, Oscar Pettiford, Charles Mingus, Ray Brown, Ron Carter, Sam Jones, Buster Williams, uh, Charlie Hayden, any, any great bass player you can think of that was in this stack of records that he gave me. And he said, well, you know, take your time, you know, cause I, I know you got, you got your schoolwork and, you, you know, the other music you like to listen to, but just when you get time, start to try to mix this in with your repertoire. And um, I think the first record that really changed my life forever was the Massey Hall concert with Dizzy and Bird and Bud Powell, Charles Mingus and Max Roach. Uh, that, that record was so profound in you know, to me, you know, this was 1983, so the biggest album in the world was Thriller. Um, and me, like everyone else, wore that album out. Uh, the following year, the biggest album in the world was Purple Rain. So, like, my two main guys were Michael and Prince, so there was a certain, you know, there's always a certain element that catches the youth, you know, whatever it is, when you're 11, 12 years old listening to pop music a certain type of adolescent energy, you know? And I heard and felt that energy in that Massey Hall concert. And I remember thinking, wow, this concert was recorded in 1953, but it felt exciting, fresh, new. It didn't sound like I was listening to old music. Um, and once again, there's a certain, there was a certain element of entertainment in that music, because everybody who, who ever saw Dizzy Gillespie knows that Dizzy was an entertainer, as well as being a genius on his horn. And uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people in the jazz, you know, jazz writers, jazz critics, you know, the, 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 the jazz intellectuals, uh, entertainment is, is, takes points away from you. Uh, but Dizzy was such a master uh, I remember listening to the record and, you know, saw Peanuts is on that record and doing Bird solo, you can hear Dizzy in the background shouting, Salt Peanuts! <laughs> Salt Peanuts! <laughs> and I'm going, man, what is Dizzy doing, man? That's so funny. And uh, 
the way that they introduced, you know, Bird says, you know, now we like to play a tune that was composed by my worthy constituent, Mr. Dizzy Gillespie. I was like, oh, man, they breaking on each other right on the record. So all that music, as serious as it was, was so entertaining and so much fun. And at that point, I became a jazz freak, you know. I called my uncle. I said, hey, you know, um, as is the case in most public schools, a lot of the music teachers are professional musicians, you know, by night. So uh, we had a teacher there at my school who brought something called a real book to the school one day. And uh, he said to me, his name was Mark Johnson, he says, uh, hey, Christian, I want you to read this down for me. Now, mind you, I'd only been playing acoustic bass for maybe six months, had really only been listening to jazz for maybe three months. Uh, he says, this tune called So What? And uh, he said, just read this down for me. And uh, he introduced me to chord sheets. He says, now, this piece of music here has no notes on it, it just has these slashes. But uh, I'll explain to you. Let's go over to the piano. So he sat me down and started playing D minor, E flat minor, all these different chords, and says, okay, now what you play, you, you start on the root, and then whatever note you play after that has to outline what's in that chord, and it also has to anticipate the next chord. It has to, you have to play a note that's going to lead you to the next chord. And uh, I said, oh, is that what they call walking, walking bass? He said, yeah, that's it. Uh, so I started playing so what? played Satin Dial, played Misty. And so I called up my Uncle Howard after I got home from school. I said, Uncle Howard, you got any, you got a, a recording of So What? He's like, I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, he then played me Kind of Blue. He then played me uh, the Ron Carter version from the My Funny Valentine, or oh, the Four and More album. Uh, and I was hooked from then on. Uh, I started listening to nothing but jazz. I fell madly in love, particularly with Paul Chambers, uh, Ron Carter, and Ray Brown. Those were always my top three favorite acoustic bass players. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I got so immersed in learning how to play jazz, I actually started doing little small local gigs around Philly. Uh, and it was funny because, you know, I was 13 at the time. And, you know, my mother had to go with me and, uh, you know, I had to get, like, you know, permission. And the, the, the bartender was like, look, when on the break you get him out of here, you know, go sit in the car or something. You, know, you can't sit at the bar, you know. Uh, or just hide him somewhere, you know. We just 13-year-olds aren't allowed to work in here, you know. Um, and I think a, 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 seri a major moment in life occurred when I met Wynton Marcellus. Um, I was 14. I was r right at the end of my 14th year, and uh, Winton came to Philadelphia to give a clinic, um, kind of exactly like we're doing now. He didn't play. He just talked. And, of course, at that time, Winton was, I mean, you couldn't get any more popular as a jazz musician. You know, the man was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He had a big feature on 60 Minutes. I mean, he was a mainstream superstar. So I remember when Winton came to Philly, the school auditorium was packed. It was very much over capacity, really crowded. All the local news reporters were there. And I mean, it was like a huge superstar coming to town. And I felt somewhat special because I knew I might have been the only kid there who knew all, his, all of his albums. So after it was over, I went up and I spoke to him. And our, our band director introduced us all to Winton. And, don't tell how much I loved Black Coach from the Underground and Think of One and Hot House Flowers and all that stuff. And uh, he seemed uh, really flattered. And about six months later, he came back to Philly. And uh, this time I had my instrument. And, uh, you know, went and said, uh, what, what do you play? I said, I said, I play bass. He said, you got it? You got it with you? I said, yeah, it's right upstairs. He said, go get it. And I thought, oh, no. I'm on the spot. <clears throat> so I went and got it, and we just played duets. I played bass, he played piano, and we just played some blues, um, maybe a standard or something like that. And um, the following night, his band played at the Academy of Music, and at that time, uh, Marcus Roberts had just joined his band. I mean, he had been in his band for maybe eight months. Um, Robert Hurst was playing bass, and Jeff Tane Watts was playing drums. 
and J Mood, his album J Mood had just been released, and uh, I'm sitting backstage watching the gig. And this is at the Academy of Music, which is a 3,000 seat hall. You know, this is a really humongous theater where the Philadelphia Orchestra used to play, and uh, NPR was recording the concert, and um, Winton plays We'll Be Together Again as a ballad, and he finished his trumpet solo, and he came in the wings, and I'm sitting there with Joey DeFrancesco, who was my best friend in high school, uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, Winton leans over and says, hey, bro, what you want to play? <laughs> I said, what? He said, what you want to play? I, I, I don't know. Um, I, what? <laughs> so he said, come on, man, I got to go back. I, I said, J Mood. I said, okay. He goes outside and, you know, he takes the song out and he gets on the microphone. Bob Hurst puts his bass down and he walks off stage and I grew ice on my feet. And I'm going, <laughs> what is getting ready to happen? And Winton gets on the microphone and he tells his audience of 3,000 people, you know, um, uh, about six months ago, I met this young man. He's a bass player. He just turned 15 years old, and I played with him yesterday, and y'all going to be hearing a lot from this cat, and we're going to bring him out to play. His name is Christian McBride. <laughs> and I went, oh, no. <laughs> and they literally, I mean, Bob Hurst had to literally yank me out on stage, and, you know, I'm just looking, and there's, there's Marcus Roberts, and there's Tane, and I just go, oh, God. <laughs> And we played J Mood, and I went somewhere. I was too, I was so scared. And um, after it was over, it was just, you know, a really seminal moment in life. And from that moment on, uh, Winton became, as he has been to so many people, he became like my big brother, uh, a mentor figure. Uh, Branford came to town uh, about six weeks later, and Branford said, oh, "Yeah, man, I heard you sat in with my brother. Man, yeah, I heard you bad." And, Terrence Blanchard came to town not too long after that. He said, yeah, man, Winton told me all about you. So Winton really kind of paved the way for me so that by the time I moved to New York City, I'd already, you know, I hit the ground running as they speak. Uh, I went to Juilliard um, to study, to further study classical music. Uh, I wound up working within the first two weeks of the semester. I uh, started gigging with Bobby Watson's band, Horizon. And that was another one of those seminal moments because now I understood what it meant to be a jazz musician in New York. Uh, it's a lot different from getting to sit in, you know, just with a, a popular band. This was a situation where I got on stage and uh, James Williams was playing piano and Victor Lewis was playing drums. This was the first time I ever, like, played fast tempos for a long time. Uh, it was the first time where somebody had actually started playing a song without announcing it. You know, Bobby t took a cadenza, and, you know, I'm thinking at some point, it was like, wow, that's nice what he's playing. <laughs> and then he went like this, bang. And I, I didn't know what we were playing, so I'm <laughs> playing all the wrong changes, and Bobby's yelling at me on stage, and him and Victor Lewis are getting angry, and, I mean, that was... That was a true trial by fire. I mean, that was just, that was an eye opener. And after the break, you know, Bobby Watson and Victor Lewis all getting in my face and said, all right, now look, boy, you better pull it together. You're in New York now. You better learn these tunes. You better learn how to keep them tempos up. And, yes, sir. <laughs> and um, fortunately, things just kind of, you know, I, I learned fast because I wanted to keep my job. You know, so I learned as many songs as I possibly could. I listened to a whole lot of albums. I played with a, I, I got a steady gig at this club called Augie's um, in, on the Upper West Side. Augie's is now known as Smoke, but um, I was the house bass player there uh, with Jesse Davis, great alto saxophonist, Antoine Roney, uh, Wallace's brother was a saxophone player. We had a bunch of different piano players. Uh, Mike Wilner, uh, Junko Nishi, a uh, bunch of people, and Eric McPherson was a drummer. So that was kind of where I got my consistent schooling in New York City. And um, 
Roy Hargrove moved to town not too long after that, and then we started hanging and playing together a lot, and met Carl Allen. Things just kind of snowballed after that first year in New York. I started working with Freddie Hubbard's band, and that's when I felt like I was, okay, I, I must be cool. You know, I got this gig with Freddie, and needless to say, whatever I experienced on, in that gig with Bobby Watson, it was like that with Freddie, ten times more, much more intense. Uh, my first gig with Freddie Hubbard, uh, he actually, it was like a John Wayne movie. He comes in, because we didn't rehearse. Uh, the rhythm section rehearsed without Freddie, and Freddie just came in and hit the gig. So uh, I'm sweating bullets. I'm like, man, I'm getting ready to go on stage with, like, my hero, you know. Uh, Benny Green, Don Braden, myself, and Carl Allen was the band. This was in the summer of 1990. And... Um, Freddie comes in the dressing room, he had his shades on, he had a white coat on, and just he comes in, you know, with his trumpet, and he stands over me and says, you must be the bass player. Like, yes, sir, Mr. Hubbard, I'm, I'm Christian McBride, and uh, Benny Green, bless his heart, <laughs> he said, him and Carl Allen said, yeah, man, this is the cat we've been telling you about, man, and uh, I mean, he knows all your stuff, man, wait till you hear him, you're going to love him. Freddie says, he looks, at, he looks over his sunglasses, he says, you know my stuff, huh? Well, stuff isn't really the word he used. He says, you know my stuff, huh? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Hubbard. He put his glasses back up. He says, we going to see. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, get ready for a gunfight or something, you know? So we, we go out on stage, and... Um, Freddie, I mean, we started out with Thermo, and then he was playing off minor a lot, then the Thelonious Monk tune, and did Body and Soul, and not once did Freddie ever give me any sense of if I was doing okay or not. I mean, he never looked at me, and, um, you know, he, on, the, on the bass solos, he would go down and whisper something in Benny Green's ear, and, <laughs> you know, just kind of walk around not really paying attention, and... By the time we get to Red Clay, which was the last song of the gig, he had not looked at me one time. So I'm thinking, oh, well, I must not, I, I guess I'm not getting a call back. Um, and uh, he says, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear five pianist Benny Green. At this point, I'm so depressed. I just, I just want to finish the song and go home. Uh, at least I can say I made one gig with Freddie Hubbard. Uh, you know, Carl Allen on drums. You know, Don Braden, tennis saxophone. Uh, he said, now, ladies and gentlemen, this man on bass is only 17 years old, and um, he played his blank off today, and you can fill in the blank. Um, and he said, uh, welcome to the band. That's young Christian McBride on bass. And so I was just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that kind of brings me to 2008 and hanging with you guys today. So... See what I'm saying? We already down to 20 minutes. So, uh, yeah, five, ten, yeah, 20 minutes. So, if y'all got some some cues, I'll give you some A's. Just stand in line uh, wherever is whatever mic is closest to. Yes, sir. What would be your uh, immediate approach to working with uh, a brand new student big band? Let's say the um, the summer jazz at Monterey, or if you go to schools or within your own uh, experience working with. Let's say novice bands mm -hmm. or or bands that you've never worked with before. What would be like your starting point and your sequence of uh, of teaching? Oh goodness, it, it varies with with each band. I've I, I've never had a uh, a particular doctrine that I've subscribed to when it comes to working with student bands. I think it all kind of falls into place once I hear them play for the first time. Um, depending on what level you feel they're on, if it's a novice band, or if it's an advanced band. Uh, I've worked with some bands that, um, you know, they were kind of just getting started. And if I know I'm only going to have maybe an hour or so to work with that band, um, there's really not that much you can do in an hour when it comes to actually making them sound completely, you know, a, a different level. Uh, but I found that most of the time when 
younger musicians have really good teachers to kind of get them the technical aspect of their instrument, I think that's more than half the battle. I mean, because I think a lot of times just being able to play the instrument, knowing how to get a good sound out of the instrument, no matter what instrument it is, uh, just getting a good sound, being able to know where all the notes are or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, I think that's more than half the battle. The creative process is locked, is unlocked over time. And I think the more you do that is, uh, you know, I've always found that, you know, when I was 14, 15 years old and guys like Winton and uh, Kenny Barron and Red Rodney and um, Grover Washington Jr. and Jimmy Heath, these guys came and spoke to us for an hour or so. They would just, you know, tell us stories or they would give us specific albums to listen to, specific events in jazz and say, okay, well, you know, you're here, so you should listen to this and, okay, you're at this point in your career, so you should do this and check this out. So um, I guess the broad answer to that is, you know, I don't, I don't really have a, a definite method, but um, as soon as I hear a musician and where they are, that kind of tells me which way I need to handle them. I find that the, 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 the music aspect is much less important than just giving them some inspiration on a human level, because you give them inspiration on a human level, that directly relates to the music. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a waste of time, I think, if you're going to spend a day or something with a uh, certain, w with a young band, you start talking specifically about scales and harmony and theory, things like that. I won't say it's a waste of time, but they're already, they are, there's already instructor to kind of do that with them from day to day. I think when you bring in certain musicians from outside, you know, our job is to kind of give you a, a spiritual boost, you know, uh, 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 to kind of come in there and say, you can do this, you know, and each person is different as to how you approach that. Help, more cues. I think she beat you over here. <laughs> I was just wondering, what's your take on uh, getting, like, a lot of jazz experience in school versus, like, going out and gigging and, like, you know, meeting people? What do, you, what do you think is the balance, and what do you think is, like, what shaped you? Um, say that again? Uh, like, <laughs> like in terms of a lot of us are going to school and studying right, jazz music. Right. What was your take on studying it in school versus going out and gigging a lot? And do you feel like that was really what shaped you? Well, you can't just go out and gig. Um, you have to actually start in school first. I mean, it's... it's, it's uh, to actually just kind of go out and start working uh, is somewhat of a, a naive, naive thought because what made it, in any, in any endeavor in life, what makes you better is being around people who can really embarrass you and kick you behind. And that's really not that easy to do. I, I think what happens in school, I think you need school. I, I'm, I'm all in favor for jazz in the school. I mean, we, God knows we sorely need it uh, all over the place, not just in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles. We kind of need it, we need it all over the entire country. And, uh, you know, getting on a the little tangent here, we've seen how the American government has uh, decisively uh, decided that art is expendable. Uh, so I think it's, you know, that's why I always commend any person involved in jazz education. I mean, I, I kiss your feet uh, because it's, a, it's, it's so hard to do now more than ever. Um, but I think even with that, it, it's, like, it's like baseball. It's like, the trip, it's like triple A, you know, triple A, double A, single A. Uh, you need that in order to go to the pros. And the pro level is not around the court. You know, there really aren't a whole lot of real high pro levels. I mean, there's New York City, there's, there's definitely San Francisco. There's a whole lot of great musicians all throughout the Bay Area, uh, Los Angeles. Um, but I would say for someone in, in your age bracket, do as much as you can in school because it's, it's going to be shocking and disheartening at first when you get out there really playing with people who are, who are much better than you. Um, but the, your, your level of embarrassment lessens when you do what you're supposed to do while you're in school. You know what I mean? You listen to a lot of records, you study your theory, you study your harmony. 
uh, whatever it is that you do, just really, really study hard in school. And then when you get out there and start gigging, you'll realize that what you learned in school really only gave you 0.1% of what you needed to know. Now you got to go back to the shed and work on it some more. So I would say at this point in your career, don't so much worry about going out and gigging because, you know, there's always going to be gigs out there that you can either get or create. Mm -hmm. While you're in school, deal with that. Get as much as you can while you're in school. And then, you know, you can go out and get some gigs. You, you know, you'll know the right time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did, did you have a... I just wanted to comment that I, I loved and appreciated your radiant, happy smile when you were performing last night, and that that's something I often miss when I watch jazz musicians, is the, yes, the joy of playing. Yes, a very serious art Yeah, it's so serious, and you, you were just so... Uh, thank you for your smile, that's all I wanted oh, to say. Oh, you're very kind, thank you. Um, I was just wondering what you would uh, advise for the high school students, like what uh, colleges you would say is the best for jazz or any of those? Um, there's a few good colleges. I mean, there's, there's always, you know, Berkeley's always the most popular one that uh, people will migrate to. Uh, the new school. Um, Juilliard's jazz program is really taken off. Um, there's a new era at Juilliard now. My good friend Carl Allen, uh, who's running the jazz department there, uh, is really kind of realigning everything up there, and it's really, really, really happening. It was happening before, but it's really happening now. Uh, Manhattan School of Music. Um, uh, there's John Clayton down at USC. Um, uh, Brother Ronald Westray is down at UT in Austin, Austin, Texas. Um, I'm not quite sure what's happening down at the University of Miami, but I know historically that was always a really good, they had a good jazz program down there. Uh, but because I've always kind of lived near New York, especially for the last, you know, 20 years, uh, I would always be I always su suggest a New York school, but you know I realize it's not quite that easy to uh, a be accepted, and then once you get accepted, you got to come up with some scratch. Uh, but yeah, all the all the, all the schools in New York are, are really good: Manhattan School, the New School, and Juilliard, and and New England Conservatory. Going yeah. back up to Boston, there's, there's some good schools out there. Um, I was also wondering um, what it's like to play with uh, Pat Metheny and. Um what like, uh, I, cause I saw you guys at Yoshi's in San Francisco mm -hmm. a while ago, uh, and you guys kicked. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, yeah, no, you guys are amazing, and I was just wondering what you guys, uh, what you think of him, and what it's like to, to be around him, and how it is to um, play with a trio like that, and what what you think is your job, and what you think, I mean, just just in terms of like communication with a group like that. Well, you know, I've played, I've been fortunate to play in a lot of trios. Um, I played in a trio with Sonny Rollins and Roy Haynes. Uh, I played in a really great trio many years ago with Benny Green and Carl Allen. Uh, I played in a trio with Joshua Redman and Brian Blade. Um, I've been fortunate to be in some great trios. Um, so I don't want to disappoint you and tell you that the Pat Metheny Trio is the greatest trio I've ever played in, <laughs> but I will tell you that it's by far one of the most fun trios I've ever played in. Uh, Pat Metheny's approach to music is much more traditional than people think. Uh, Pat Metheny comes from the West Montgomery School. Yeah. Uh, he's very much rooted in the jazz tradition but uh, Pat has definitely been able to give it a very personal touch that makes it sound unlike anyone else. And um, what is awesome about what he's created, particularly with the Pat Metheny group, I think the Pat Metheny group to me is like one of the biggest and best legacies 
in um, in music history. What he's been able to create with that group and that sound, uh, I think he's been able to take a small percentage of that and and bring it to when he does his jazz project. You know, all the great ones like 8081 and uh, the trio he did with Dave Holland and Roy Haynes, uh, Charlie Hayden, Billy Higgins. But uh, I said all of that to say that Pat is actually very traditional. You know what I mean? Playing with Pat Metheny is actually not that far removed from, you know, say playing with Benny Green. You know what I mean? Just in terms of concept, like what the role of the, of the bass does in the band, uh, the way the songs kind of flow, uh, you know, the form of the songs was kind of demanded of everyone in that group. Um, so I, I enjoy it immensely. And, and I, you know, I've been working with Pat on and off now for 15 years. Uh, we all know what a serious advocate he is for uh, young musicians. Uh, and he works hard at what he does. So I have the utmost amount of respect for him. Thank you. Yep. Five already? Hi. Hi. Um, you said you went to Juilliard and studied classical yes. bass, and I'm wondering if you stayed the whole four years since you started working so quickly, and also if you recommend that for young uh, jazz bass players that they should also study classical. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer your first question first. I, I think it's very important, uh, particularly for bass players and piano players, to uh, study classical music because it, it, particularly for bass, it's an instrument that requires a lot of awkward type of strength and accuracy to play. And um, I think we've seen many, many, you know, although they're great, great jazz basses through the years, uh, technically there's always been something that could have even made that level of playing even that much better. And I think, uh, you know, guys particularly like like Robert Hurst and, and, and Reginald Veal and Ira Coleman and uh, Scott Colley and Drew Gress, uh, guys who have had classical, Larry Grenadier, guys who've had classical training, um, they play really in tune. Right. They have really good even sounds up and down the instrument. Um, but of course, classical music can't teach you how to hump, you know, get <laughs> that real big, funky, nasty sound that I feel that you need to play the acoustic bass. <laughs> Uh, but in terms of the technique, I think it's very important, uh, particularly for bassists and, and piano players. You know, there's a whole slew of sloppy piano players out there uh, playing two notes at once by accident. And, uh, you know, it's just the, the, the chop thing is not happening. But, you know, we kind of rub it off as being soulful. Uh, no, that's not the case. Um, so, yeah, I think cl classical studies is, is important. and. But no, I, I did not finish at Juilliard because I, like I said, I started working and uh, after my first year, I started working with Freddie and uh, I, I realized that I had to make a serious decision to see the school or the road. And I said, well, I can't imagine schools going anywhere. Freddie Hubbard might not be here forever, so I'm going to go with Freddie. And uh, I don't regret, I don't regret it. But did you enjoy the time you spent? I loved it at Juilliard. I learned so much there. My bass teacher there, Homer Minch, who was, uh, he, he passed away about a year and a half ago. Uh, he was for many years the principal bassist with the New York Phil, and he always had a soft spot for jazz musicians. I mean, he, he's one of the few instructors at Juilliard from the old guard, like when jazz was a no-no. Because, -no. you know, when I went to Juilliard, there was no jazz program. Uh, he was one of the few guys from the old guard who listened to jazz. He loved jazz. A lot of his closest friends were jazz musicians. You know, he, he taught uh, Bob Cranshaw, uh, Seanette Moffitt, a whole lot of guys. So um, I, I immensely enjoyed my time there. Thank you. Yep. So I just one more, huh? Oh, two, oh, oh, two minutes. I, I got to dig the uh, Juilliard Quartet out in New York just a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Really good, but, um, I was wondering how you how you felt about a lot of the fusion because I understand you played with DJ Logic last or a couple of years ago at MJF and uh, you have a lot of also like open ideas to mixing jazz with other styles of music. Mm -hmm. and I've been interested in like electronica and jazz. And what what other influences do you have outside of the jazz world? 
Well, that's a broad question. Yeah. <laughs> you, you probably know that already. I mean, I mean, it's 2008. There's been a whole lot more music in the world other than jazz. Yeah. You know, uh, some of the jazz that we like has been has had influence influences from other cultures. Yeah. You know, I mean, like a lot of the jazz that we deem real jazz is actually a fusion from somewhere else. So, uh, I mean, I, I tend to put it this way, although I may not be influenced by everything, I certainly give everything a chance. Yeah. You know, if you gave me, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I could sit down and listen to Charlie Pride and say, hmm, <laughs> I could probably get something from this. Uh, you could put on, you know, REO Speedwagon, and I might be able to say, yeah. okay, there's something in there I could probably use. Eh, probably not. <laughs> but I'll give it a chance, you know what I mean? I guess I meant more what inspires you to actually take your music and say, I want to make it a part of this also, or bring it into your style a little bit. I don't know. It, it, it varies. To, a lot of artists some, sometimes just stick with the same thing that's comfortable, whereas right. I find you go outside right. a lot. And, right. You know, how do you find what's going to really be a safe zone that you can Well, I just try to back up what we say this music is about. Yeah. You know, a lot of musicians preach that, you know, this music is open, and, you know, you got to, you know, be open to all these different influences, you can't stay stagnant, but these are the guys who make 10 albums in a row that sound exactly the same. Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, f whether you like it or not, I think you always got to give dap to Miles Davis for, you know, he never stayed in the same place. What, like I said, whether you liked it or not, yeah. uh, you got to give the man at least credit for the fact that he was always interesting in checking something else out, you yeah. know. And uh, Chick Corea is like that. Uh, Her Herbie Hancock is definitely like that, um, and so I've always wanted to follow the, the footsteps of those guys, the real, you know, true innovators of the music. I know we're, we're pressed, but I said one more thing. If you're really strapped for cash, not good enough to get scholarships, but you want to <laughs> study at like the best, what, what do you recommend for someone who's get a job. not scholarship level? <laughs> that's that's simple. <laughs> Get a gig, man, like a, a <laughs> nine to five gig, you know. I, that's, that's what I, when I left Juilliard and, you know, I can't, you know, the gigs didn't really kick in right away. I mean, they, they kicked in just barely enough, so I was like barely making it month to month. I still owe Mark Carey back rent from <laughs> 1990, but, um, you know, I had to go and get a, get a gig, man. You know, I, fortunately I wound up not needing, I applied to the Gap. You know, yeah. um, I almost got a gig at Shea Stadium. You know, I'm one of those minions trying to get into Berkeley, and it's like 15 a semester. How am I ever gonna? Yeah, I know, man. It's, it's a struggle, but you know what? It's it's par for the course. Yeah, you'll be cool. You know, get go to CVS or Walgreens, or something like that. You, you know, get you some supplementary dough. You'd be cool. All right, I think, I think we got to close up shop now, right? All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's been real. Thank you very much.